Well, good evening, everybody. Wow, so many of you here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, and welcome to this Inside the Industry event. Uh, it's the third one of these that we've done. And what we do is we take a look uh, inside the fashion industry. Um, and we're extremely grateful to our partners uh, at Topshop who've enabled us to put on these events. We've taken this show, as it were, on the road to New York. We've done another one in London um, and, uh, and they've been really great. And so we're very, very grateful to Topshop for helping us put this on. Um, as I think you all know, the theme for this evening is about how to build uh, a fashion brand that breaks through uh, in an extremely competitive space. And I couldn't be happier uh, to be hosting this particular one for a few reasons, actually. One, most importantly, it's given us an opportunity to put together an amazing panel of very inspiring women. Uh, so we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. I'll come on to that. Uh, secondly, I don't think there's been a more interesting time to be uh, in the fashion industry, to be thinking about starting a band, brand, growing a brand, um, or a band, yeah. either. <laughs> Um, and um, thirdly, and this is very personal to me, as an ex-agency guy, the opportunity to spend uh, an hour or so talking about marketing and branding with three amazing experts in that space is, uh, is just a wonderful uh, opportunity. Um, the one thing I will say is that I have a few questions lined up, as you would expect, but my experience tells me that the best questions in these kind of things come from the audience. So we will get to, without uh, uh, too much delay, a time for you all to ask questions. So if you could start thinking about uh, the questions that you have, that would be, that would be great. We have some um, roving mics. I can't really see, um, but we'll, um, we'll make sure that we get to, to those questions. So please think of those. Um, but before that, what I wanted to do first is introduce the panel. Now, I'm going to keep these introductions relatively short because before we go too far into this, I'm going to ask each of you to talk a bit about your careers. But let me just start with um, some introductions uh, and then we'll progress. So to my immediate right, we have Holly Rogers, Chief Executive of the legendary, I know that, that word gets used a lot, but the legendary uh, fashion boutique Browns. Uh, so Holly, you've been at Browns for two years. You've done a lot in that time. Um, uh, incredible um, success and growth in the business, um, overseeing and establishing a world-class management team, overseeing the opening of a new distribution center, um, leading the boutique's first full rebranding in 47 years, which I'm going to ask you about shortly. Collie has also applied her curator's eye to Brown's buying, expanding the brand portfolio significantly across both menswear and women's wear. So welcome, Holly. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next to Holly, we have Katie White, uh, Managing Director of ID, uh, the iconic, again, a, a word that's used a lot, but a definitely iconic fashion and style bible, which has grown, as I'm sure you all know, from a hand-stapled zine into a leading digital video and print brand um, across the globe. Under Katie's tenure specifically, lots of expansion into new territories, including China and Japan, uh, exponential growth in video output, had some amazing people on the cover of the magazine. Adele, Stormzy, Justin Bieber, Justin amongst Bieber. a few. <laughs> Talk a bit more about that. Um, rolled out into luxury lifestyle and travel as well with a new site Amuse. So that's great. Um, and a lot of large scale commercial success. So um, thank you so much, Katie, for joining us. Great to have you here. And then at the end, last but very much not least, uh, Leila Fattah uh, is joining us as well. Uh, she founded her first agency at 26. Yep. Incredible. Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> <laughs> um, but more recently, has just announced a new venture, yeah. Platform 13. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk about that. Very exciting. Uh, and Platform 13 leverages uh, your unique experience working for um, Adidas Originals as global uh, PR and social director, and then more recently at Diageo um, as head of culture um, and entertainment. Yeah. So um, again, a real range of experience across the panel. Um, and I'm sure this is going to be a, a wonderful discussion. Um, so, as I said, we're going to talk a lot about brands and how to build fashion brands. But before we get into that, one of the things that's been a common theme across the three inside the industry events that we've done is I've just, we've just asked people to talk a little bit about their journey, their career. Because what struck us as we've talked to amazing women across three different panels is that the journey to success in fashion takes many different paths. So, Holly, I want to start with you. Can you just give us a bit of an overview of how you've ended up as CEO of Browns? 
Um, yeah, I never actually thought I'd be CEO for all you women in the audience. Um, I, studied, I studied it at school. I studied fashion merchandising. I actually didn't really know what that meant. Um, but it was the program that made the most sense at my university, and I grew up in Texas. And um, I just always had an interest in fashion from like day dot, it felt like. And so every opportunity I could get around, to be around product was really important to me. So I worked at stores. I worked in so many stores in my career. I worked on the shop floor. Full, I remember folding sweaters at Christmas time was painful, um, or jumpers. And then at university, I also did a lot of volunteer work. There was a museum on campus where I got to learn incredible history about fashion that has actually served me to d till this day, what I learned there. And to have access and understand the different fabrications and all the, the different designers at the time and where the inspiration comes from for today even. Um, and then from there, again, worked on the shop floor after university because I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And it was there that I realized um, that buying might be a potential career path for me. So that's basically kind of where I, I navigated through. But I think a big part of it also was just being really passionate about what I was doing, understanding that you didn't have to be in a rush necessarily, that things will happen as they should, and you have to trust your gut and a lot of that. And you also have to trust the people around you that can support you. Because I had a lot of really amazing people, namely my dad, but um, people that I worked with, at, people at the university, different people that supported me and kind of helped push me along in, in my endeavors. And so that was when I went into buying. and. At that point, I realized in the middle of Texas, I wasn't going to really see a huge amount, so I really needed to be in New York City. And then moved, went ahead and moved to New York. And in that space, I moved into a different side. I moved into the wholesale side. So I think it's also really important to see as many elements of this business as you can, because you get an understanding of how you can approach people later on. Because if you understand where they're coming from, you know how to talk to them better and in a more empathetic way, I think, also. And then from there, I remember, I was actually just repeating the story yesterday um, to Tyler, but we, there was, it was at the time that Boo.com started, and there were fly postering all over Manhattan. And I was like, what is this online entity? Like, at the time, it didn't exist. You know, this was like 99 or 2000. And I was so intrigued, and that just really, like, that whole, like, where was this going? Where was this fashion? journey going and interestingly enough I ended up moving to London uh, for personal reasons and ended up working at netaporte.com and it was there who knew what it was going to be so I would say that definitely taking risks and not knowing what's ahead of you and always thinking you have to be super prepared because you never know how it's going to unfold was probably one of the reasons I have actually been able to be successful and this whole thing of being black and white is not necessarily um, always a must, I think kind of being in the gray area, so to speak, so you can actually figure out how to navigate what comes your way. And then I left Netaporte and um, Jose Neves called me up and said, so I've got an interesting idea I'd like to pass by you. And, and so now I'm a CEO. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> just like that. I love that from shop floor to CEO. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, you know, and it strikes me that when you talk about these things, and I think this will be true of everyone, in reverse, there's a sort of logic to it. But when you're building or going through your career, you know, you don't necessarily know what comes next. You no, just no take, you, something feels right and you, you kind of you take, a, take a punt on it. Yeah. Katie, what about you? Managing yeah. director, how did it all start? Well, I think you described my, uh, your career actually as indecisive earlier. And I think I like there's, there was a bit of that for me as well. Cause I, so I started, um, I started life in advertising, in advertising agencies, and um, I was a strategist and I helped lots of different types of brands from um, lots of different sectors to, um, to launch new products, to mar market existing products. Um, and it was fun. Um, I described it to my mum and dad once as like a very sophisticated form of manipulation because I was understanding audiences and understanding brands and what they wanted to do and putting the two together. Um, but 
what happened was a few years into my career, um, someone started talking to me about this thing called word of mouth marketing, um, which we now know is social media. Uh, lo love a buzzword in the advertising industry, they really do. And um, we, and I thought this sounds interesting and I was working at the time with quite a lot of gaming, music, um, film, entertainment clients and what we were finding was that we were doing all of these like big billboards and all of this um, sort of traditional marketing work around like launches of new films, new games um, and what hap you know what was happening was like it, it wasn't necessarily working so well and we realised that there was a lot of conversation happening in blogs and forums. This was like pre-Facebook, pre-YouTube. Lots of like this sort of conversation happening and opinions about this stuff in the entertainment industry was being made or broken in these spaces. Um, and we developed what I now see as a very rudimentary form of an agency that, uh, that helped brands to interact with their audiences through these channels. And then a young man in America, Mr. Zuckerberg, did something wonderful and launched this thing called the Facebook. And um, I was kind of already in the social media marketing space. So I was really, really lucky. Um, and I was probably one of the first people that was formally working in social media in London at that time. So I was like first off the mark and then obviously in advertising, which I know we'll go on to talk about loads, um, loads more this evening, but the whole industry just was shaken up almost overnight with content and all of these social platforms and all of the ways that like we were all really comfortable and familiar with like ads and you know, um, like we were still doing leaflets at that time, like, God, I can't remember. Um, all of that stuff was blown out the water yeah. and um, we were sort of really developing new ways of, um, new ways of uh, communicating with audiences for brands. And then um, I was, it was a, a chance meeting with a person who's now a very good friend that took me into another world, which was properly into the world of entertainment. And I had a little stint for two or three years at a company uh, who were um, doing the social media for celebrities and influencers, which is a crazy world. Like it was a company based in Hollywood called The Audience and, uh, and did uh, um, lots of work helping these celebrities manage these crazy um, big, influence um which call it like follower bases millions and millions and and mainly stopping them getting drunk and going on twitter rants actually quite a lot of my job was about that um very important job very important job very difficult job yeah. uh and so that was great and it uh, um and really interesting and then um i moved to vice actually uh not not long about a couple of years after vice had bought um bought id and I did six months there working with those guys on uh, media strategy and with, with brand partners. And then uh, the uh, CEO said to me, we've got this thing, we think you'd be quite good at it. We bought ID a few years ago. We've, we've really started in earnest the digital transformation because when Vice bought ID, ID was a ma just a magazine. It was an amazing magazine that I read religiously, but it was a magazine. And um, after ID joined the Vice family, this huge digital transformation uh, began. And it was there was lots of video happening. The site was up and running, but what it required then was yeah. this global expansion and just a little bit of refinement around how we worked in social how we took all of the great stuff that Vice was doing and brought it to a fashion space because I think you know the industry um, struggles with the change sometimes compared to other other industries and other worlds so um, and I was absolutely delighted because I've read ID religiously since I was about 12 years old so um, was able to join the um, very welcoming and amazing ID family um, and have been there two years now uh, and I think because Holly shared a lot of wisdom of how she was thinking. I mean, I just kept jumping off cliffs in my career. Um, and I think you said it, Nick, like following my gut. And that, you know, that for me was, um, you know, I'm so, I, I couldn't have imagined that I would, um, I'd be working in this position in uh, ID, but I just, you know, for me it was, and like I've married now my sort of passion um, and fashion and, and culture and all of the things that we do so well at ID with this weird, checkered skill set that I've got around digital and social and content but um, it like I think a lot of it is following actually it sounds really cheesy in my head so I'm gonna say it anyway but like following passions and you know if you have a gut feel about something just going for it like you never know what's around the corner so if it's usually if it feels scary it's good yeah and what strikes me and, and again this is a theme that's come out is you need a bit of luck 
which sounds a bit, you know, a bit challenging, but actually to some degree, and again, this is a bit cheesy and a cliche, you make your own luck. If you, if you, if you try hard enough and you work at stuff enough, luck kind of happens to you. Yeah. So I think that's kind of interesting. Lely, I have the privilege of knowing a bit about your um, backstory, which is um, incredibly inspiring as well. So can you just shine a light on how you've ended up where you are now? So all of it's a bonus, actually, to be completely honest, because I come from a place where the, there wasn't any opportunity at all. Um, I came from apartheid South Africa, where we had no opportunity, and actually the only opportunity for us was working in the post office and etc. Um, but I think for me, I've always had this insane curiosity about stuff that happens in the world. So I've always looked at things, and my mum always said, you should have worked in the stock market because you can spot a trend coming. And that's just always been an interest of mine. So I'm always looking, I'm saying, what's happening? You know, those blogs and, and forums, like I was on that stuff way before, only because there was interest, not because I was going, oh, I'm gonna use this in my path. You know, it wasn't like that. I have a curiosity about the world that I think has led me to where I am. And this opportunistic sort of luck that happened when I came to London, um, and I was bribed to come to London to finish my university degree. My mum was like, I'll buy you a ticket. Just finish your degree, please. First person in the, in the whole you know, family to finish a degree. And um, I had this really opportunistic moment where, and I've, I've said this before, and I think it just set me on this path where I was coming to London because this little island um, for me in the third world um, was this really influential place. You know, it had punk, it had Vivian Westwood, it had all these things that were just like, oh my God, like fantasy for me, living in South Africa and looking at Europe and the world in, in a different way. And, uh, and so, and I had a shaved head because it was the Sinead O'Connor time. Um, so I was like, I'm gonna shave my head. So the shaved head, and um, if you have sh shaved heads, it grows out pretty badly. So I came to London, first week, I had no contacts, I had 200 pounds, that was it. It was a lot of money for us in South Africa, um, but they sent me on my way. And um, I was walking past a hairdressing salon um, on my first week. Um, and I was like, in my head, I was like, great, I can have my head shaved for free if I work here. That was literally the motivation. <laughs> and um, walk past this hairdressing salon on my way to see the King's Road, that's where Vivian Westwood's from. And the phone was ringing, walked back, the phone was ringing, walked back. And I walked into the hairdressing salon at Sloan Square and I was like, your phone's been ringing. Uh, three, like three times I walked back, backwards and forwards, you must be losing business. And it was Tony of Tony and Guy Hairdressing who gave me a job on the spot um, as his receptionist um, for his new school, which was opening the following week, which was awesome because I only had 200 pounds. So that was great. So I guess it's a bit about opportunistic and it's a bit about, I think if I knew who he, wa if, who he was, I would have had a bit of fear but what that's instilled in me is that for me, everyone's the same. So I never have a fear about doing anything because actually everything's a bonus. So I'm just stoked <laughs> where I am in my career. And I think because I have this concentration on what I'm, what I'm doing here and not really thinking about, I'm doing this to get this to get this, I'm really focused on what I'm doing here. And I used to be really surprised even starting my own business when people would like know what I was doing, I'd be like, wow, you heard about that. You heard, you know, I was really, and still today, if I think about Adidas, which is amazing, and, and Stan Smith, which was my first project, um, I still get surprised when people go, wow, I saw that campaign and it was, you know, it was incredible. So for me, I guess it's just appreciation, real appreciation of opportunities. And, and you guys have all of this stuff in front of you. It's incredible. Just look at the opportunity, identify it, and just grab it and run as fast as you can and see, see where it gets you. And uh, in a few years, you'll be sitting up here uh, with Nick Blunden asking you the same question. So, so I've got a bit of a crazy career. So started there, Tony and Guy. I had a huge interest in um, digital because I read a science fiction book called Neuromancer by William Gibson when I was 15. The one book I brought with me in my suitcase because I wouldn't carry a backpack, very uncool, on my travels. And it was about, it was a science fiction book about um, people having these computers and they jacked it into their head and they traveled through the computer and connected with each other. So when the internet came, you can imagine, I was just like, oh my God, it's here. And it was called, um, he actually came up with the term cyberspace. So it was an actual science fiction, which is really interesting. So um, actually my first business, the 26 one, was what I call the first online marketing company in, in London, fashion marketing company after Tony and Guy. 
um, and I wanted to really be within this area that had no case studies, no way of knowing how to do anything. My first client was acupuncture footwear, if everyone remembers that, I think you too young, had a big anarchy sign on, was really, really cool. And we had this website and they were like, what are we going to do with it? But of course, no one had email and no one had computers and there were no websites. So actually, the first thing I did was call Vice because I knew Eric Lavoie from the mag magazine and I exchanged articles with Vice for the website for shoes. And um, so just started to build this way of marketing that's very much about it's very instinctive and it's really just going, this is the product. This is the audience. How am I going to get these two things together? I've never had any training in marketing or in anything I've done. It's all been learned on the job. So opportunities are out there. Just grab them and run. See where you get to. And we'll be watching. <laughs> I think the interesting thing about hearing all of that, and um, you, you will put, you will join these dots, is in between the luck, in between the opportunity, in between um, the, you know, taking a, going with your gut is a lot of hard work. I suspect that there, between these three amazing women, is an extraordinary large amount of hard work as well. But thank you for sharing those stories. Very, very inspiring. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit now and go back to the sort of main theme um, uh, of tonight's talk, which is to talk about building brands in fashion. Holly, I mentioned this in my intro, that you know, once you got the call from Jose and, you, you know, and you're going to Browns and you're coming in as the CEO, and I bet you've got a list of things that you're thinking, we could do this, we could do that, we could do the other. One of the first things you decide to do is to launch a rebranding, um, I'm gonna call it program or project, piece of work to rebrand uh, Browns for the first time, I think, in its history. Why start there? Why start with the brand? So what you don't know is that we actually started with the product okay. a bit before that. So while there was a lot of really great product in there, we had to shift a little bit the, who, who we were talking to. And because the fashion cycles work in the way that they do, we had to do that a few months earlier. So we were already doing that on the side. Um, because for me, Browns, has stood and will continue to stand for um, supporting new talent. It is an incubator of fashion and it also at the same time just has incredible fashion and some of the coolest clothes you can find. And it had veered a little bit off that path and I just wanted to make sure to get it back on that path and make it relevant again. And um, so that was where the product piece came into me because that's to me fundamentally particularly as a retailer, that's what you should be doing. You have to have great product. People will forgive you your sins on so many other levels if you have that right. But it wasn't just enough for me in that regard. I mean, I, I think it's not wasn't necessarily about trying to make my mark or anything of that nature at all, because that's really not the type of person that I am. But it for me, it was like, how do you shake up something that's existed for, it's almost 50 years old, and make people take note again? And I think that just, again, it was back to more like intuition. It just felt like this is what we needed to do to reestablish ourselves. So we worked with an agency and worked on a new logo. And it was interesting because that whole process of trying to figure out who's your customer, who you're trying to appeal to, what's important, and taking all these elements and kind of mashing them together to figure out like, and, and then what do you want it to be? Because that's the other piece of it. It's like, where, where are we going? What do we want from, it, from this? And um, so we changed the logo, all of the packaging, the colors, all of it changed. And um, it just felt like it needed to be a little bit more punchy, a little bit more relevant to now. And um, I've had really good feedback from a lot of people on it, but something that I really liked about the logo in general was that it, we, we played on the heritage factor for sure, because I didn't want to shift away and just go really like plain. Um, but it's a hand-drawn font, which I really love that idea of it kind of hearkening back to that, but it doesn't look too dissimilar from the old one. But um, we purposefully on the packaging, for those of you that have seen it, it sits at the bottom of the bag. And part of that was really conscious in that we wanted to say in a really understated way to everybody, we are a container for all these really great brands. It's not so much about us as a, com as a brand, it's ourselves. We are about all these other brands that we carry. So that, I really loved that whole idea. And everyone's like, my legal team was like, um, half your logo is missing, Holly. And I'm like, no, no, it's, it's not, it's not. We're gonna be fine. I had so many people say that to me. But then also even down to our swing tags, um, we split it apart from men's and women's. It's like, you know, how it kind of can run through all these different um, 
aspects of what you're doing day to day, but the men's tags, if you look at them, say bro, and we split, as you, if you split the word apart, it's bro and wim, WMS, WNS, and it's like, so it looks like bro and women's. So we put all of the bro tags on the men's clothes and all the women's tags, and if you buy it online, you get because we couldn't really differentiate then. <laughs> but all of that piece of it was just really thoughtful for me because that's, that's to me also how you should be approaching a rebranding effort. Really interesting um, to hear you and, and I'm so glad you said that it didn't start with the brand, it started with the product. Because I think sometimes when we think about brand, we think about brands in isolation. And brands are a reflection of something else, right? They're a reflection of the business, of the culture, of the, of the product. Um, and Leila, I'd be really interested. One of the pieces of work that you worked on, you talked about it, Stan Smith. Really interesting branding challenge there because you've got a product that's existed mm, for you, a long, long time. For a long, long time. Do you approach that when you think about brand? Do you approach that differently when it's a, um, a you know, a heritage brand in being sort of revived yeah. in some way? And I was lucky at, at Adidas because I actually worked on both that heritage product, um, which was really in the sale bucket, and. Um, I loved it because I love a challenge like that. I was just like, yes. And also because I, so I worked on both um, a heritage product, product and a relaunch and a re, uh, relaunch of that as well as a new product. So I can probably give you the, the differences between the two. But what was great about the heritage product was the knowledge and insight of the culture. So I have worn sneakers my whole life, actually. That's, tonight I'm not because I'm, I'm trying to be a bit more, you know, grown up. Um, <laughs> But um, so, yeah, so I, I, I knew instinctively coming from sneaker culture, from sneaker blogs, etc., cetera, um, that the Stan Smith, that shoe in a time where it was so tech heavy sneakers, it was, you know, the bright colors, Nike, the innovation, blah, 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 you know, and even Adidas running as all bright colors. It was amazing, white, clean shoe. So I wanted to work on the heritage that actually that that silhouette. Um, was the leveler for all sneaker lovers because actually it's the one shoe that everyone has in their in their back cupboard but just irrelevant what we needed to do was take that heritage and then kind of revive it to make it relevant I was talking about what happens every day so for me brands are relevant if they are relevant in culture people are talking about them and that is a real reflection of the time but I don't think if you've got a heritage brand you should forget about it I think you need to make that relevant today because I think it is different heritage is amazing but I think sometimes people maybe depend on that a bit too much and go down this long heritage story. Whereas I think you go, actually, what are the learnings from that? What are the, what are the insights? And how can I switch that up to be relevant today? Because everything's different. The media is different. The way people shop is different, everything. So that was really interesting because, um, oh, nice shoes. <laughs> um, it, was, it was brilliant because that was almost like, how do you launch this in, an, in a way that the audience now get information. So one thing we did was the first part of the launch, I did a phase launch over, over a few months. Um, I called it the, the, the green and white takeover. And um, the first part was the shoe. I don't know if you, everyone knows what the Stan Smith shoe is. There's a tongue with Stan Smith's image on it, sort of hand drawn. I should have been wearing them on the stage. Yeah. Here, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but um, what was really interesting, the first part was I was like, I know that there are 100 people around the world who are super amazing lovers of Stan Smith and I want to gift them with their own face on, drawn in the same style. And actually, I got such a big pushback from the company going, but we've never done it like that. We always create the shoes. And I was like, but we own the factory. Give me the shoes without anything on it and I will draw them on. So it's about going, what is it that, you, 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 that usually has happened and how do you just hack that? It's about hacking it. That's how you're going to get to innovation. That's how you're going to get to newness. I think what happens, there's such a huge, you know, people are just like FOMO, you know. What are they doing? I've got to do that. What are they doing? They're not thinking about what they should be doing for what's right for the actual brand. So that was one. And actually, that was hugely successful because you can imagine we had it all timed on the same day. And this was a nightmare to do because I had to get specific shots of all these 100 people by their friends and their PAs secretly so that they sent me all these images that had to be front forward high res you know in a certain way so i could have them hand drawn so they were all dropped on the same day globally on the on the offices of every single person so you can imagine social just went boom 
and it just felt like the green and white takeover and that was only phase one can i so, can i ask that you was just a, a bit of background did you yeah. know because the the, the the wonderful thing about those panels is we've all got hindsight right yeah but i'd be interested to know did you know when you were handed that opportunity that brief I that did. said I did. you know work on stan smith yeah. did you think I this is an like, amazing opportunity yes, yes because for me i'm all about challenge so for me i was just like okay that's really hard it's in the sales buckets people don't care about this and that for me was awesome because i love to get under the skin of something and really come up with something that's new and fresh and and because i don't have a background or or, or training in any way i'm totally unblinkered <laughs> in a way so i'm just like well why can't we do that of course we can do that i'm all about possibility so so for me it was amazing and it was great to work with a brand that as you can imagine you know back where i'm from you know you work for this you've always worn this brand and it's always been around this kind of like oh my god i work for that brand that i used to wear and you know covered for so long and to be able to do a project like that was incredible but it was also really interesting getting a new product which was dropped on my desk in october and they were like we want it out in january and knowing you can imagine from fashion that just takes a long time a global brand to be able to do that but again we tried to do it in a really different way and um i think we had i think our target was thirty thousand, and we sold over a million in the first year so um yeah i've been really lucky to have these amazing <laughs> like, amazing projects yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, which product that was zx flux um which i still see all over london which is brilliant so coming back from germany when i went it was so dominated by other brands and then I came back I was like wow everyone's wearing Adidas on the tube it was unbelievable because when I left I was like okay no one's wearing anything you know you were checking before you went out and um it was really great to see how stuff hits the ground and people really love it enough to spend their money on it that's really what it's always about yeah. it's all great doing a great a great idea but if no one's spending the money to actually grow your business then it doesn't really matter and Katie I'm I'm intrigued because there was the doing things differently right and there used to be a playbook to some degree for launching or growing a fashion brand and it involved media and I think in its history ID has played a really important role in um, helping to establish and grow um, fashion brands but of course over the last certainly after the last ten, over the last 10 years things have really changed right you know the media landscape has really changed um, first the advent of digital and then social media and so brands like media brands like ID and indeed Amuse have a different role to play in helping fashion brands to emerge and grow how do you think about because you with your agency background I mean you've got a very sophisticated understanding of, of, of the, the role of branding how do you see ID playing a role in in the in the growth of the brands that it works with yeah well I think you set me up beautifully actually <laughs> because um, you know for me like it was all by design it, yeah you know, no, no, we no, didn't yeah, practice yeah, no, didn't. Um, but it's so you know so much of uh, brand success is about cultural relevance yeah exactly as, you know Always. exactly as you yeah. said and I think the the big challenge that um, I think that brands that we come across and, and I think just even as a consumer observing the, the big challenge that brands have is that the the life cycle of what is relevant in sure. culture is just like speeding Fast, up like maybe. so much because of because of social and digital and technology and how all these how all of these um, you know the, the, the way that people consume content and consume culture yeah. and create culture is just being driven forward by tech um, and so when when brands come to us like quite often they're challenges are twofold even if they don't know sure, it yet sure. so one might be that they're struggling with this technology with these platforms and they're like well my print ad's not working on yeah, my instagram yeah. channel or whatever it is um and then you know the second thing is then that actually their brands have lost like fundamental relevance in culture because either they're trading too heavily off the heritage yeah, story yeah. or like they've maybe just got it slightly wrong in terms of like where like which you know subculture they're trying to launch sure. into or whatever it is and what you know what we're doing at ID and this is something that ID's done for nearly 40 years now is we're actually like creating culture and working with the young people that create that culture um, and so what we're able to do with the brands that come to us is actually first of all give them insight mm -hmm. so I think it's really challenging for brands today because you know it's it used to be really straightforward even in even when i started it used to be really straightforward you'd have a marketing team a brand team they'd look at you know what the brand stands for yeah. the hierarchy yeah. of the brand all of that stuff great good still really good valuable yeah. stuff and then they'd think right print ad tv ad yeah. and then website like how does this all play out and now you've got these 
big, complicated, like multifaceted teams that are trying to get a brand out yeah. there, keep it consistent, yeah. mm -hmm. like make it mean something in culture. And it's it's really, really challenging. And so what you know, what we find though is that we we have that sort of we have big multifaceted teams as well, but they're all we, we've got a much simpler job in the sense that what we're doing is we're engaging people in culture. We don't have to sell yeah. a product at the end of it. Yeah. So all we need to do is listen yeah. and, you know, look for the stories that really resonate with people and then just tell them kind of better than other media channels, which obviously we do. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, when, so, and so what we what we have in doing that is this amazing like base of insight into what's happening in culture. Quite often, a lot of the people that are friends of ID, either working with us at ID or part of the network, um, are the ones that are making this stuff. So the creatives, the you know the guys that are like creating culture. That's exactly the point. I think one of the biggest struggles at the moment is brands trying to buy their way into culture. You cannot do it. It's a long term piece you've got to contribute to that culture if you want to be a brand and the only way to do that is to kind of really think about what your values are of a brand what is your message so yours was, was is lovely you know we're an incubator like that out of that you can see all the stuff that you can do from a marketing point of view because your message is extremely clear and that needs to run through everything that you do so i think that's really important is really know yourself and know what you stand for and if people if some people don't like that just let them go that's cool but um this idea of creating culture, represent, shaping it, that's the area that you need to look at or else it's just going to feel really transactional around it. And that's never going to cut through. That's when you, if people are not talking about you, in a world of social media where algorithms are changing all day long, you know, the dark social, for me is my next really interesting area, 84% um, of brand conversations happen not on social. It happens in your WhatsApp groups, it happens on Messenger, and it's immeasurable at the moment by big media companies. So you go, 84% of people are talking about my brands. I could have been doing something really awesome for them to be talking about my brand. That's a great challenge, actually. Then you just, you move away from the, and I don't mean media, your media, because I think ID is in a different, unique space. I'm talking about the big advertising, out of homes, et cetera, um, and other places, and social media, where 84% of recommendations are not actually seen. That's a really interesting place. So if I'm going to speak to you on my WhatsApp group, I'm not going to talk about something really dull, am I? I'm going to talk about something that's really interesting that a brand is doing. So actually, the challenge out there now is just do something original and interesting and don't worry about what other people are doing. That's the point. And that was really interesting, Katie, to hear you talk about, because what struck me in you describing the way that, you know, the insights is that actually, from that perspective, the media is no longer the end point. It's no longer the last bit in the, right, we'll put an ad somewhere. It's part of the process of getting to, it's part of understanding the culture, it's about it's part of understanding the audience. It's much earlier in the piece. Right? Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's very much, you know, where we're seeing success. We did a huge project, year-long project with Chanel that's um, only just coming to an end. And, you know, when we, we work with Chanel, the fragrance team really far upstream to like look at actually what you know what as a brand what and, and as a product it's an entire sector to be honest what fragrance did for for young people and we worked with chanel to help them redefine that and regain that um that uh what's the word like that relevance within you know the the culture of um of, of our audience of young people and i think a lot of what we're seeing is that brands are coming to us as a way in as an authentic route in to begin that journey exactly. so to begin to rebuild that relevance and rebuild the the relationship with with the audience um, and, and to that example I think a lot of what we saw was the the as Devlin piece out there which actually wasn't a media buy yeah it was an ID created experience which I thought was awesome so it's kind of like you know that's what I see yeah out there, that's what we talk about. When yeah. we talk about this dark social piece, sorry to listen no, to no, you, no, 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 no. Just wanted to, just wanted to make exactly sure right. that, yeah, yeah, it was great. Yeah, and I mean, that's, you know, that's not, that's not advertising. Yeah, that's, exactly. you know, we work with Chanel, we, it was events, it was video, exactly. it was, we, it was actually a, a channel within ID that we launched with Chanel and it's, um, it's a, you know, it's a completely different landscape to how it was, uh, you know, how it was even three, four years yeah. ago. Um, and yeah, no, that's exactly w why they're coming to us is and how. In, and, you know, it's not always, it's interesting actually if you look at it on the flip side. We quite often, and this is naming no names, but quite often when brands come to us at the other end of that process mm -hmm. where they're like, you know, quite proudly lay out the assets yeah. from the campaign on the, and, you know, I watch our creatives and our editorial teams just go, 
like that because it's just you know we know our audience and we know what's going to work well with them and um and it is you know it's really it is interesting when you see like the that brands look so introspectively at what they and, and particularly when you know f for you i'm sure like when brands have got such an amazing heritage and they're still amazing brands and there's nothing wrong with what they're doing but like how you know looking outside of yourself to think like well how do we now take all of this great stuff these years of heritage and like re-spin it so that yeah. it means something to people exactly. today and in social platforms and in exactly. you know in technology and you know recognizing that people the role of going in store has a completely different thing to people now because they don't have to so they can buy online and there's plenty of choice and all of this sort of thing so all, like the fundamentals of how people interact with brands are different and that's definitely what we're trying to help our brand partners navigate and it, it's it's interesting because to that point about the role of the media or the paid media for one of a for a better word has has changed there's also, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, and I'm going to come on to you, Leila, to talk about this because it's a segue from what you talked about when you were talking about your, your career path. You know, people talk about, well, now in a world where the Kim Kardashian and Selena Gomez have a social following that is bigger than the combined following of most major media brands put together, shouldn't we all just be moving into influencer marketing? And Leila, you and I have talked about this in the past, but you know, there's this, been this sort of as if influencer marketing is a brand new thing oh that's never goodness. happened before, <laughs> oh. and that is a panacea that solves every problem. And I know you have some interesting perspectives on this, so <laughs> give me your three minutes on: is influencer market, marketing actually a new thing, and is it the answer to every brand building challenge? So you know what the saying around money venture is: rest in peace, influencer marketing. Uh, long live influence because for me I think there's a definition issue and I feel like everyone just goes influencer marketing but of course within fashion we've been doing collaboration forever because we didn't have a media budget <laughs> there was no other way to do it but to partner with people with the same values shared values etc to be able to create something new so for me that is what influencer marketing at its heart should be it's really collaboration uh, mutually I think what happens now is we're paying people uh, to advertise for us. So I'm like, call it advertising. I'm good with that. Just don't call it influence because that's a really different thing. Influence comes from expertise together, um, not how many fans and followers you have somehow because also there's, I think there's, I think there's a little bit of education piece to do because if Selena Gomez has a billion people who follows her, that doesn't mean that much because she can only, she can't see all that stuff and her billion followers cannot see that one post that she puts out because it feeds really quickly. So I don't think there's a direct correlation between a million people, whoever has um, as an influencer, it's really hard for me to say that word, um, <laughs> and actually how your product is being seen. And especially because the bigger the, the followers, the more products are on their pages. So how are you gonna stand out differently? And we are really at content saturation stage. Because honestly, if I see another beautifully curated, you know, image with brand X, brand Y, brand Z in it, I'm going to kill myself. It's total wallpaper. So you go, what is it you're trying to do? What's the message? If it's, you know, you know, an incubator, what's the content that's needed to actually in service of what you're trying to do, not another pretty picture about whatever. Um, I just feel like that's a waste of time and energy for everyone. And at some point, people switch off that stuff and that's why people are going dark and that's why people are getting off all the social networks because it's an overload. The internet minute is insanely busy. It's like four million videos are uploaded a minute. A minute. So all your target audience, they can't see everything that's going out there with other brands, news, friends and family. You know, I think it's slightly naive to think that that million people are going to see your brand. They're not. So and actually, you'd rather have someone within the culture that you're working with to create something, you know, that's going to get your message out there in the right way. And there's an engaged audience underneath who are really interested in that culture. That's really what influence is about for me. So you heard um, it here first. Influencer marketing is already dead, although it's new. It's all about influence. <laughs> Again, I just want to... before A friend, gonna... of mine, a friend of mine, sorry, I said a really good thing. He was just like, influencer marketing. Remember Jesus Christ and his disciples? That was influencer marketing, so I'm going to leave that with wow. you. We are, we are on very <laughs> precarious ground here. <laughs> that um, was a friend so of mine who said that, you know I'm, who you are. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah. We're going to go to the audience for questions in just a few minutes. I just have one particular question, Holly, that I just want to ask you. The other thing, because I want to tick off all the buzzwords, so we've done influencer marketing, 
The thing that everyone talks about, again, in terms of brand is brand experience. It's all about brand experience now. And I think that's a really interesting challenge if you're in retail, because clearly you've got different experiences. Um, and people talk about omni-channel and they talk about the online and the offline experience. And my question for you is, is it more important for you when you think about the brand experience of Browns that it's completely consistent across the in-store experience and the online experience? Or is it more important that it's optimized to whatever channel you're in? Well, it's interesting. <laughs> One of the reasons why I took this job is because I worked in online yeah. for 12 years. So this, for me, was a big challenge to understand this old bricks and mortar world. And um, so I've been grappling a little bit with this, to be honest with you. But it, every time I hate that term omni-channel as well, because I don't think it can actually exist. I really don't. Um, so we, in the business, say multi-channel. Yeah. And I think it is about optimizing your different channels, actually recognizing their value for what they are. And it's like if you, we're just going to be opening up a new store soon, and it's going to look nothing like the one on South Moulton Street. And that is purely the intention. Nothing should be cookie cutter. There are a few elements, I think, that definitely need to be present to have that consistency. And that is a tone of voice. For us, it's tone of voice and how we're talking to people. But yeah, your social channels, your store environment, your website, all of it needs to kind of look and feel and on brand, but it doesn't have to be replicated. I mean, also, we've really done, like, I think actually, interestingly, the um, Basquiat exhibition that's just opened here, which I can't wait to see, haven't Amazing. had a chance. Everyone go. She's got her t-shirt on. Um, we actually have an exclusive collection at Brown's, <coughs> and it, this was actually probably the first time we've been able to implement the full, like, kind of 360 multi-channel piece, kind of seamlessly, and, and, and it's taken us a little while to get to this place, but we're finally there, and I was super proud because the windows all across South Moulton Street Every single one of them, the family came in, they were like beside themselves with, they, they thought we just did such a good service to, to, the, to their son and brother and whatever cousin. And um, taking it into the website, we did video specific content just for the website that was also used in the windows. We have the product in the store, which is fantastic. And then all the social channels that we, we use this, some, some of the same content through. But again, it wasn't the same exact all the way through, so. I love it. We've got multi-channel, not omni-channel. Yeah. I also really dislike the term omni-channel, so <laughs> I'm gonna go with multi-channel. Okay. Now, do we have any questions from the audience? I think we've got some uh, roving mics. If you've got a question, could I ask you to put your hand up and when you get a microphone, if you could just introduce yourself and then, uh, there's a question down here at the front, uh, introduce yourself and if I could, um, just ask you to try and keep your question relatively brief because I'm sure there are quite a few questions. So I think there was a question down here at the front to start with. Hi, my name's Selena. Um, for each of you, you in particular have already indicated what's interesting you next with Going Dark. You're all very ambitious, jumping off cliffs, taking you know, chances. <laughs> what's intriguing you that you're not doing, that you haven't explored, but that you've seen or got a slight Oh, that could be the thing. What's intriguing each of you next? I knew the questions would be better from the floor. That's a great question. Who wants to go first? Uh, I'm, as, as I mentioned, for me, dark social is really interesting because it also happily plays on my old PR skills because it really is about really challenging everything when it comes to brands about how you're going to get people to talk about your brand. Like, that's a really awesome brief, actually, if you think about it. And it's something that you, all of you can think about, whether you're small or big. It's like, if you had no money, um, and I'm sure a lot of, some of you starting won't have any money, that, you know, there's a, there's a dream there. Um, how do you do something awesome that's cultural, culturally relevant, that people want to talk about? I think it's almost old school PR. It's really interesting and it feels like there's a, we're at a really amazing crossroads of communication with data, VR, a, all this stuff. Like we really at this moment where it's a switch. It's almost like the next industrial revolution for communication, I really feel that. Um, but then I'm overexcited about stuff. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I feel like actually this is an opportunity for people of any size and coming from anywhere to be able to really make their mark if they're really true to what, what, what they do and just really focused on what they do. So, but for me, it's about what can people do that are awesome 
And because now you have social in other places, you can share that whether you're a, you know, a one man band or not quite widely, quite quickly, but it has to be good. And that's what's exciting me is actually good marketing. <laughs> That would Katie, be brilliant. What about what about you? That was a that's a hard question. Um, can I have two answers? Yeah, <laughs> I'll be quick. So, one thing. Well, they're kind of like associated answers. So, one thing that's really really interesting to me, where are you? Um, is what's uh, what's happening? And maybe we can talk about this afterwards. But what's <laughs> happening with with commerce? Um, yeah. and like how people are buying and how like scarcity marketing and how like you know these things I had to work extremely hard to get and like all of this sort of thing um, and I, I live on Brick Lane and every Saturday morning I walk along Brick Lane and there's some kind of like sneaker drop with like 300 kids outside getting extremely excited and committing like to queuing up for it to get you know and just you know what happened with the uh, Vuitton and um, Supreme launch and all of this stuff I'm really interested to see like particularly for fashion and luxury brands how that's going to play out um, and you know I on that I think like I'm the the re, you know the retail space experience and all that sort of thing I think it's really interesting I think that's going to have a resurgence and I want to see how that's going to play out and sort of on that as well like one of the things that's fascinating to me is um is how the old me like the old media is going to change and uh print for example as one thing we just acquired garage magazine mm. um which if you don't know you should check it out cuz Gar- garage has got an app that goes with the magazine that does all this amazing ar and vr stuff and it's just created for me this like new massive excitement for what like our book can mean you know what the id mag- you know id print uh, product will will be um and you know for us people still read our magazine and like you hear all this like these big headlines like print is dead like all of these sorts of things but for me it's not about that it's about how all of these old mediums of communication and the way that brands and um and and uh, channels like like idea communicating with their audience how we can and basically the creative platforms that they provide and how we can mix that stuff up and mix technologies sure. and yeah so it's more like i'm really excited about how the old worlds and the new worlds are going to keep yeah. keep clashing great and I'm, I actually kind of feel the same way about that. Is the, that's also one of the reasons why I came to work at Browns was just to understand how we could use, start using the technology play in the store environment and how that can merge and actually give you a new shopping experience. It's a little more uh, personalized for you as you come in the store. And you know, what does the store look like? How is that going to evolve? What is that going to be for you know, all, what we all want? And we can get anything we want at our fingertips, basically, at you know, 2.30 in the morning. So why do you want to walk into a store? So for me, it's about how that's evolving and what that journey means for the customer and maybe just the person who's browsing. Yeah. Again, it's like that clash of old and new. Great. Uh, do we have another question? There's another question uh, there. If you could just tell us who you are and uh, ask your question, that'd be great. Hi there, um, I'm Vienna. I'm one of Business of Fashion's Future Voices. So it's great to see you again, Nick. And um, thank, thank you, you so for much. Thank you coming. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for this talk. It's been really fascinating hearing your stories and learning from your experience. Um, my question is, I don't know, probably quite simple, but I think it's very practical. I feel like I'm looking around this room and I'm seeing a lot of people who, you know, maybe have dreams to start their own fashion business or media company or whatever it is one day. And I think what you said about creating culture is really important and that it has to be relevant. I completely agree with that. But I think it still kind of doesn't get over the hurdle of the fact that we are so oversaturated with images and content and things like that. And you can have an Instagram account, you can be on a Facebook page, you can optimize your you know, SEO or searches or whatever with Pinterest. But at the end of the day, there's so many people doing that. What do you think is the best strategy to actually get your relevant content out there so that people can see it? I think for me, it's about understanding the culture that you want to be part of and then working with the voices. So I think there's a little step back that needs to be taken. This is what I was saying. We're at saturation point. There's just so much out there. What is it going to be the one thing that's going to make your brand different and stand out? And it's got to be the reason for it existing. So you go, if I love, so for me, fashion or drinks or whatever is really about culture because it's never just one thing. It's not only about the fashion, it's about the culture that surrounds it. So if you're into you know, sneakers and it's hip hop or whatever, it's the culture of hip hop and sneakers is part of that. Or if you're into 
um, you know, really insane makeup and it's, you know, it's electronic music. That's cool too. That's, so it's almost like how do you become part of the culture where your product has a role to play? I think that's really what it's about or else you're just shooting in the dark. Um, it's, it's your reason to exist. Would you think that would happen through, you know, collaborations and things like that? Sure. Like you were talking about before? Sure. And I think and I think people are open to it. That's what I've always found. As I said, I'd had no context at all. But I found a lot of people who and especially in London, um, where you're almost embraced for being completely different. And, and in fact, that's what people want to see from a place like London. That's why we've all come here. That's why, you know, we're here. And I think what happens is because there's this FOMO, oh, I've got to do my shoot like that because these hundred other Instagram people are doing it like that, it means that everything just becomes super generic. So you need to decide, not you, people need to decide what is their point of view, what is the culture they're trying to be part of, and what is your contribution to that, and how are you going to do that? That's the only way for me where you're going to get these amazing experiences because they're going to be rooted in who you are and what you're about. Just I, FOMO, yeah. guys. <laughs> I'd, Stop I'd, um, <laughs> I'd build on that as well to say, and this, is, this isn't really a strategy per se, but I'd yeah. say that talent is still really, really important. Yeah. And like, ta you know, you talked about product, product like, you king. know, the product it's still king. has to be amazing. Yeah. And like for us, the way that you then kind of communicate your brand and product is still, it's really important. And, you know, we talk about it a lot because obviously photography is a really big part yeah. of the ID brands. Mm. And it's like, everyone's a photographer now. We've all got exactly. iPhones, we've all got Instagram channels. But, you know, for us looking, for the next you know amazing photographer exactly. we've you know started, um worked really early on with harley weir and now she's like a huge name and like it's just people like that that are actually standing out they've exactly. got the courage to do something different, different. Um, yep. but they've also just you know they're working really bloody hard on their skills and their ability to kind of make things that um that's that do stand out and i think there's a lot of cynicism around that i think that people think that talent's not important anymore and and there is you know there is a bit of that like crazy influencer marketing stuff and certain influencers that have billions of followers and I watch their videos and I'm like what is going on but um rest but in actually, peace rest in peace, rest in peace. <laughs> we're gonna Thank get God. rid of a guy please um, help me <laughs> but you know I, I still and, and for longevity as well like you know if brands want to last like commitment to yeah. making great stuff is still like as important as ever as it's ever been sure I'm going to take one more question from the floor. Do we have one more? There's definitely one down here. I'm sorry, we're going to run out of time again. Blame the host. My fault. <laughs> um, just introduce yourself, please, and one question. Sure. Hi, I'm Nanki. Um, so I very recently launched my own brand. Congratulations. Thank Congratulations. you. It's, ex it's exciting. What's it's the brand work. called? It's called Galad India. Um, should be Galad, but we're working on SEO, so <laughs> Galad India till then. Um, and it's very exciting, and to your cultural point, we've tried to keep it very different. Sure. But everyone seems to come to us and say, influencer marketing, that's the cheapest way to go, that's the way to get your name out. But as a brand that wants more substance, yeah. we need a proper campaign, and that's expensive. expensive. How does a new brand sustain in that kind of an environment? So for me, it depends on what you define as influencer marketing. If that means going, here's 10 people, I'm going to send them stuff or I have to pay them to do. I pay them a lot. Yeah. So, so, but for me, that's, that's not influence. That's called advertising. That's expensive. What I'm trying to say from my point of view and my experience is your point of view is you've got a, you've got a reason to exist and you have a point of view. How do you even work with one other person? And then you create something so brilliant in, 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 in your campaign or in your, in your imagery or whatever it is, that that gets shared. And then you can get the scale. Do you understand? You don't need to have many people to work with. You, can just, you could work with one person, an amazing photographer or whoever. It doesn't have to be many. Because if you have something that's amazing, it will be shared. Do you understand? And that's what... Well, maybe we'll catch up with you. I'll catch up with you afterwards because there's something. The, the beauty of social is that people share it, and that's how you get scale. But for people to share it, it has to be awesome. And if something isn't awesome, no one shares it, and then you don't get bigger. So that's the point. You've got to do something awesome, but it doesn't have to be with many influencers. It can be with one group of uh, one, someone who can influence because they're doing something different. Do you mind if I quickly ask one more? So do you, in your experience, have you ever seen a brand have a click that it just goes viral because they put up one post? And I don't, I have never seen that. 50 comments and 10,000 likes. 
Personally, for me, I don't, I, I, I've, I've never seen that. And I've been around for 20 years. So, and, and for whether, me personally. And even if I can't sort of cite any examples, but even, you know, like sometimes when that does happen, whether that actually would convert to sort of a so, sale, mm. um, would be, uh, you know, I'd question that, I think. And, and to be honest, I feel like actually there's a lot of stuff that happens way before. So Supreme, everyone talks about now, is 20 years old. I don't know if everyone realizes that brand has been around for a long, long time. My husband wore it the first time around. So we see what we see today, but that's built on culture and created that comes after time. I think it'd be very hard to just do that in it's out, that word viral. That's another word. That's a myth. That's not Holly, have real. you seen in your, you know, in the, in the various roles you've had in retail, have you sort of seen that where you feel yeah. like something has just Gone. exploded from nowhere? Yeah, no, I have. In fact, I was just thinking, I always get it wrong. Kate Middleton, <laughs> when she wore that blue dress. And at the time, I was working at Net-A-Porter, and we had that blue dress in What stock. was the brand of that? It was Issa. But Issa's been around for a long yeah, time. Yeah, they've been around. But I mean, that, they already had a following and whatnot. But that, her wearing that dress, I mean, it just blew out the door. We did a reorder, and we did, could have done, like, if they had enough fabric, we could have sold thousands and thousands of units off the back of her wearing that dress. But you know, they always say like the Kardashians, this and the da 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 da, all those ones that we love to hate. Um, that they do have influence, we totally get that, but it's not necessarily, is it, is it on brand for you? Is it who you want to be? Does it make sense? And in a, lot of in a lot of cases, it doesn't. It actually doesn't. But I think it's, as long as you're being authentic and genuine to who you are, and, and you find the people that want to do that with you, I mean, it's, it's incredible like, what you can actually do if you can find the, the right people to work with. Or get a princess to wear your dress on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a good princess, strategy. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to ask one final question, and I'm looking for a one-word answer <laughs> from each of you. Um, and, uh, and what the question is, and I don't think I pre-prepped you for this, so this is a bit <laughs> naughty. But, you definitely um, didn't mention this one. There are a lot of very ambitious people, very talented people in the audience. And if you had to think of one characteristic and, or attribute of somebody who's going to be successful in the fashion industry going forward, what, what, would, you, Holly, what would you say is the one thing? When you, you know, a lot of people coming to you looking for jobs. What's the one thing that you look for in somebody? Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. Perfect one word answer. That was Katie. a really good one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> Curiosity. Curio enthusiasm yeah, no, and curiosity. Oh, no. It's getting harder for you, you see. <laughs> enthusiasm, curiosity. Layla, final one from you. Um, for me, it's literally like the passion of what you do. And it includes all these things. I think all of these, all of these areas in, are kind of connected together. Because without passion, you're not curious and you won't be enthusiastic and probably the other way around. So for me, that's really what it's about. And I think curiosity is a personal thing for me as well, but you stole that one. So. Enthusiasm, um, but curiosity yeah. and passion. Yeah. That is a mantra to live life by, I think. So we have run out of time, um, but if you will just bear with me, I have some thank yous that I want to give. And uh, three letters. Yeah, and some other stuff that I've been briefed to do. But let's start with the thank yous. Mm -hmm. And would you first start in joining me in thanking our wonderful panel? Thank you. It's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you all so much. Um, I'd also like to thank Topshop. Um, it's been such a, a privilege to partner with Topshop on these Inside the Industry events. This is the third one, as I say. Um, they've all been absolutely fantastic. And we don't get to put on uh, these type of things without um, a wonderful partner in Topshop. And a lot of work goes on behind the scenes. So I'd like to thank Topshop and everybody who at Topshop has worked uh, on this and put this together. So thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank the Barbican. This is an amazing space to um, have one of these. And, and I feel very privileged to have yeah. had the opportunity to host something here. It's a, great, it's a great building. So thank you very much to everyone at Barbican for putting us up here. Um, but I also would like to thank the BOF team. I have the pleasure of sitting on this stage um, and having this wonderful conversation. But as you can all imagine, a lot of work goes on behind the scenes. The BOF team uh, are absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much to all of the BOF guys. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us, both the people in the room and on the live stream. As I uh, guessed, uh, 
um, the questions were much better from the floor than the ones I asked. So you made me look good. So thank you very much for that. But thank you so much for devoting your time to come to, come to this. Um, three little things I just wanted to mention. One of the um, attributes of the partnership we have with uh, Topshop is they have enabled us to provide free student access for BOF professionals. So any of you in the room who aren't BOF professional uh, student members, if you make sure you um, leave us your email address, you get free access to that. The second thing, uh, if anybody in the room is interested in uh, BOF education courses, Olivia is here somewhere, right at the back. Um, we do run some courses. We are committed to helping people break into and succeed in the fashion industry. So if you're interested in one of our courses, please see Olivia. And last, but definitely, definitely not least, we will be having some drinks after this. So uh, if you've got time to join us for a drink and do some networking, uh, we'll be in the conservatory, I think. I've always wanted to say that, sounds very poor. <laughs> we'll be doing drinks in the conservatory. Um, and so please do join us. But that is all we've got time to, for. So thank you again, and thank you to the panel. Pleasure.